welcome to the Midlife Leap, a lifestyle talk show for women in midlife. I'm your host, Sunita Johnson, and I am excited to share tips and interviews on topics ranging from business, career, current news, fashion, shopping, health, travel, and so much more. And because I'm known as the Midlife Leap Coach, from time to time, I'll share some of my signature Midlife Leap Coaching tips. So come on, ladies, let's reignite and reimagine our Midlife Leap journey together. This winter, in the midst of the pandemic, Millions in Texas lost power, which shut down uh, grocery stores, banks, gas stations, transportation, and, and many, or, many more services that we depend upon every day. Now, have you wondered as a result if you're prepared for extended power outage? If so, here are a few tips that's provided by FEMA to help you prepare in advance should your community lose electricity. Tip number one, keep your mobile phones and external power devices charged at all times. Two, have flashlights and extra batteries on hand. Three, you're gonna need food. You're not gonna be able to open your refrigerator uh, you know, constantly because there's no, no electricity. So you wanna make sure you have stored canned goods on hand such as soups, uh, beans, and tuna fish. You'll also need a manual can opener because you won't be able to use your fancy electric can opener. Other foods that you can keep stored on hand are like peanut butter, crackers, and different snacks. Number four, You'll need hand sanitizers and handy wipes on hand at all times. And five, you should have at least one gallon of water per person in your household to last for at least three to five days. Now, for more tips on how to prepare in case of a power outage, go to www.ready.gov slash power dash outages. Ladies, do you dream of writing a nonfiction book or to share your life story, but you don't know where to start? Kate Emerson is our guest today. She's the co-author of Write Your Book in 100 Days. She gives writing retreats and she mentors aspiring writers. She has a step-by-step -step process on how to write your book, and she's helped hundreds of women, maybe thousands of women, to write their book. Now, whether you're a rookie, a, an experienced writer, a storyteller, influencer, a company leader, or a speaker, Kate will share some of her tips that will help you put your words on paper. Welcome, Kate. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a real treat to be here with you. Thank you. So tell us. You're joining us right now from Greece because you have a writing retreat that starts tomorrow. It starts tomorrow. We've got an intimate gathering. It happens to be all women, just that's how it's worked out this year. Um, and you mentioned co-author. My business partner is uh, Sarah Bullen, and she's actually stuck down in South Africa and isn't joining me. We always run these together. We are best friends and business partners, and it's going to be so different this time because we've got to zoom her in because she does all the technical really advanced writing and I'm really here to share my passion about brand and nonfiction and getting your message out and reaching more people and I have quite a no-nonsense energy and so our strap line is stop mucking about and just do it um, and one of our kind of support groups on Facebook was called stop mucking about because I think that's the trick is so often you know unless we are big name author, you know, on our seventh advance, and we've been given millions thrown at us, there is actually no such thing as writer's block. There is all the other stuff like procrastination, laundry, the monsters in our head, but not really writer's block. And so often we just need to find ways to take all of the stories and all of the ideas that are in our head and our heart. And it's almost like we have to pull them down our arms through our fingers and either onto paper or onto the computer. And it's so much bigger at the beginning because we don't always know how to do it. And I remember for my first book, it was called, is called Clear Your Clutter. 
And it was simply for me a way of being able to sit in people's homes when I couldn't be with them and say, this is what you are going to do. Here's where you start. Here's where you go next. And this is how you march through your house. And I wanted them to feel me sitting on their shoulder. So one of the things with writing is thinking about what's the voice you're going to use. You know, is it the one that you are typically embodied all the time? So mine is a little bossy, a little kick arsy, a little sassy. And that's how I write. Because my, my clients say, Kate, I can hear your voice nagging. Huh? Um, but I can hear you sitting there with me. I can feel you. Mm -hmm. So your writing style might be completely different. It might be compassionate or big sisterly or kind of grandmother energy of the wisdom. So one of the things is thinking about how do you talk with and to people? And if you can find a way to bring that voice to your writing, it's just like you think about one other person that's going to read your book. You don't have to worry about the hundreds that sit behind that one person. Simply talk to one person. And what do you want to impart to them that will help them see something differently or change their life or just take a moment out to have a sense of humor or a different perspective? So I think sometimes we make it so much bigger than it is. And when we break it down, it's just simply sharing your ideas with one other person and finding a way to put that in the written form. That's interesting that you say, think of just the one person. When I wrote my book, it took me a year because I felt that it was so, that it was sort of angry because it was, it was, the book is Supreme Warrior and it was basically how to fight through the battles of life. You know, although you've done everything perfectly and everything right or as perfectly as possible, that things still may, are not going to turn out perfect because life is not perfect and just about the chaos in the world sort of kind of I was like oh my god this is so angry and, and I paused probably for like four or five months because I wanted to make sure this is what I wanted to write that this was the message I wanted to share and I had to soften it a little bit because I didn't mm -hmm. want to scare people or make it sound too negative mm -hmm. really and I, I think what you said is something about timing so you can sit down like I do and kind of bash out a book really fast. If you are, you have your structure, you know, if it's nonfiction, your, your chapter or your table of contents, if it's a memoir, it's more seen, kind of a little more plot driven. But if you've got that structure, you can pretty much bash it out quite fast. Um, if you're a good typist, or you can even do it, you know, on voice notes and get them transcribed. If you speak more easily than you write, you know, there's different ways of doing it to get the book to its end form. But there's also something about timing and sometimes books need to take longer to be birthed because we need to be in the right place for them to come to life. So sometimes we think I've got to get this book out. Look, if you're writing something that is very, um, you know, contemporary and it's about political or when Biden's just coming to power or COVID, you've got to be able to be quick off the mark and publishers want it today. And there are those kind of books that are brought to market. But sometimes it takes you know, a year, three years, four years, and only when you're ready to pick it up and go, okay, here's my book, here it is, because it's like really like giving birth, and you put your heart and soul out there, and you've got to be ready to kind of take the pros and the cons that come with that, because not everyone's going to love your book, not everyone gives a damn about your book, <laughs> and it's like thinking about who needs to read this book and who am I writing it for and why and holding that as your focus when you are actually sitting down because also writing's lonely you know it's you sitting at your computer which is why we find it so important to bring a community together either on a retreat especially now after we've all been separated in our homes but how do you try and bring people together in that intimate setting but the actual construct of writing is really lonely because it's you and your head and your heart and your computer or your pen so it's finding ways to dance between the solitary pursuit and then the company of other writers to inspire you, but not to break you down. So it's finding the right community for you. You know, constructive feedback is something really invaluable, but you don't just want criticism because that can take your little dream and make you go and squash it in the tenth drawer under the seat, you know, under the floorboards and never write again. So just being mindful of who you surround yourself with, I think is really important for writers as well. Do you find that um, sometimes some of your participants in your retreat or your clients don't know their voice, especially midlife women? I mean, a lot of times they're, they're mothers and they're, 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 they're uh, 
employees or business owners and they're focused on everyone else that sometimes they don't even know who they are, who their voice, who, what their voice is. 100%. And the thing is, you can't know that until you're in the doing of it. So, so often we want to, I want to know everything. I want to know everything about how I'm going to write this book and get it to market. And so that stops people. You find your voice in the writing. You become a writer by writing. You become a better writer by writing more. You know, it's in the doing. It's in the practice. It's writing is a practice. It's not a, you don't start off perfect. You start off writing a terrible first draft. When you've got something on the paper, then you can finesse it. Then you can make it better. Then you can change the tone. Uh, you cannot perfect it all up front and you don't necessarily know your voice and the joy is in the writing of it to discover your own lessons your own learnings your own uh, like demeanor you are never the same person when you've written a first draft than you were at the beginning you always will be a changed person whether that book comes to fruition in your hands or not a book changes you as the writer of it how many days are your retreats? They vary anything from five up to 10 um, because you need time also to immerse. You know, so often we do things quickly. We want to just do something in a day or a weekend. So we find, especially when you're traveling, you know, to a beautiful idyllic location, you need travel time. You need time to rest and settle in. So when we do international ones, there are seven nights. Uh, residencies are often a little longer. Um, this year, people are coming for 10 to 11 nights because travel is so uncertain that I said, if you're going to get here, stay. <laughs> and, and, and with them being with other people who want to write as well, they probably tend, it's like a community of, where they can share ideas and share problems and, and solutions. Of course, so we take them through technical writing, the actual skill of writing, but there's also heart exercises, you know, for me as a life coach side, like bring that, who are they in the writing of the book? What are they writing and why? Often people are processing um, old hurts, baggage, trauma. If you're writing a memoir, you're writing your story, it might not be a humorous take, it might be something really deep and serious. Sorry, I'm starting to get a little hot here in the Aegean. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I'm looking at that glorious sea just out there waiting for me to dive in it. So um, the other thing also is feedback. So once you've written something, if you've only got it in your own voice, in your own head, you don't know what it sounds like. So to be able to sit and have a community of peers hear what you've written, whether it's two lines or 20, there is so much power in that. Whether they say something or not, you reading your words and having it land is so powerful for us because we can't do that on our own and just seeing other people's faces or verbalizing those words and reading what we've written it's just absolutely magical and is such a big part of the process so the writing process is what you cover do you also cover uh how to actually publish because there's a lot of publishing houses self-publishing a lot of different avenues <laughs> Yes, so we cover everything from how to write the first draft, how to do a second draft, because that's very different brain, requires different skill to writing, how to publish the different options, because there's traditional, there's hybrid, there's self-publishing, you know, a bit about brand and how to actually think about yourself as a brand. Your book, if it's nonfiction memoir, is like a business card. It's like the best business card you can have. If you're a speaker and there's two speakers that are pretty similar and pretty similar budget-wise, Typically, they will choose the one with the book because there's something that they get to take home. So if you've spoken to 100 at a, at people at a corporate conference, but they've got a little slice of you to take back and help them think about their leadership differently or their employee satisfaction differently, you're going to put the, the other speaker to the post because you've got a little more uh, brand credibility. It's amazing the power of a book when it, in terms of elevating your business. It is something that, you know, it doesn't, not digital necessarily, but being able to put something in somebody's hands, it's tactile, it's tangible. They go, ah, look, I mean, I came to this village and I gave my, I have an office by the sea and I walked up to Andra Mahi and I gave her this book written in and signed by Sarah and myself. And she's like, I've been coming here for six years. Kate, Kate, that's you and Sarah. I'm like, you know, I'm an author. She says, yes. But it's here, here you are. She knows we come here, we take our writers there for breakfast, but now you see it in the flesh and that's something traditional and it's something archaic and it's something 
we like holding a piece of someone in our hands. It makes it more real. So a book is a great business builder. Wonderful. Okay, Kate, so we have to go. Please share your uh, how you can be contacted and the next dates of your retreat. Right. So my next retreat, I'm doing one on July 15th in um, Lesbos in Greece this year. Next year, we're doing Greece and Italy and probably Spain. So all of those are on my website, kate-emerson.com or my business partner's uh, website, which is thewritingroom.co.za. Um, because we we both have the the information. Uh, You can grab a copy of our book, which is a very practical, no-nonsense book. You can find it on Amazon in digital and paperback. And people can reach out on social media as well, on Instagram and Facebook. And I will always reply, me, not an assistant. Um, I will always respond if you send me a message. Wonderful. And we're going to have you back very soon to talk about the, what was the other name of your book? The Uh, the other one is 10 Lessons for Living Location Free. Yes, so we'll have you back for that. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me.